Hi, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'm Josh Mitchell. Um, I, in addition to the topic that we're going to be talking about today, I'm also going to interject a little bit of the Portland area for you. So if you're not from Portland, I am. I've actually lived in Portland since about 1989, minus a couple years where I moved away for a little while. Uh, I love this place. It's a beautiful city. Um, how, many, how many in here are from Portland, out of curiosity? Okay, yeah, so about a third of the audience. Y'all will almost already know all these sites that I'm going to point out. Uh, this first one, uh, you can see me pointing to uh, Mount Hood right there. That's actually at the top of Rocky Butte. It's a nice little park in uh, Portland. Beautiful views of uh, Mount Hood, but also Mount St. Helens. Uh, one heck of a bike ride if you do what I call the two buttes, right? I don't know why I always say it with a Jersey accent, but two buttes. <laughs> you go up to the top of Rocky Butte, and then you make your way over to Mount Tabor. Beautiful views, fun stuff. Um, so I'm the founder and principal consultant of M6L. Basically, uh, I help teams learn Drupal. I help teams learn how to do uh, enterprise website development, um, and that's, that's been my focus for the last six years. Um, if you know my secret username, I've been on Drupal.org for 18 years. It's not Josh Wami that's been on Drupal.org for 18 years, but I do have one out there. Um, let's dive into this. So we're going to cover uh, what's in Drupal core. Um, really brief on that, just going to kind of speed through it. Uh, we're going to talk about a really simple approach that I've used several times that actually might be a good candidate for uh, Starshot, on honestly. It's, it's just a good set of sane defaults. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into the group module, which is one of my favorite ways to do access control for really complicated websites. Um, we'll also review a few other options that are for maybe not as complicated as group, but they give you some good starting points that we can talk through, including one that I learned about yesterday, and there's no demos of it because I couldn't get it working, but I am going to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to briefly touch on what happened to organic groups. Um, and then we're going to talk about which one might be the best for your particular product needs. We'll kind of dive into that. So I said at the top, I was going to show you some beautiful things. Uh, for those of you in Portland, you probably are familiar with this view. This is Crown Point looking out down the uh, Columbia River Gorge. It's one of the seven wonders of the natural world. Go see it, especially this week. You're about to get some of the best weather Portland has to offer. If it's 70s or 80s in Portland, it's like all these really bright, pasty white people flooding out into the <laughs> space and it's it's beautiful all the all the quirkiness that portland has to offer so um drees mentioned <laughs> in the keynote so i thought i should kind of bring this up the idea that access policy api is making it into core and i just want to explain i'm not actually covering access policy AC api uh, but christian who is the maintainer behind the group module is actually one of the, the the people that was really pushing that forward, and it makes all these access control modules easier to set up. It makes it easier for their code to work. It doesn't actually represent anything that you're necessarily touching when you're doing the site building portion of things, but I want to call it out so you could kind of know that it's there. Um, I typically start with a set of roles. That's the fundamental thing that you have to have in Drupal, right? You have your uh, kind of standard roles. You're automatically going to get uh, anonymous. You're automatically going to get it authenticated. You're usually going to automatically get administrator. It's an optional role that you can have set up. Um, those just come with Drupal out of the box. I almost always add two more. I add this idea of a contributor role, somebody who can create content but can't necessarily make it available to the public, and a publisher role that can actually publish it. So when we're thinking about those roles, of course, you're going to add permissions to them. And um, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the other thing that Drupal is most famous for, checkboxes. <laughs> um, I was just talking to uh, a <laughs> former teammate that was working on a project, and he goes, yeah, we can't actually open the permissions page anymore. <laughs> it just dies. Too many roles. Yeah, it happens. So we kind of take permissions for granted, but there, there's something that you can set up for any bit of custom code that you're adding, and they're in a lot of different contributed modules. The place to look for the permissions to kind of understand the structure is in the permissions YAML file. So you basically set out these uh, lists of machine names. They're not really machine names because they don't have underscores, but there's like the, the human readable name, and then there's going to be the name that's going to be used when you're setting the permissions. And when you go to use a permission, um, it, this is an example here, really basic one, where you've got a route subscriber, and it's saying, okay, I've got the 
permission for access content overview, I want to apply it to this admin content route, right? Very, very simple. Um, but they can get really complex depending on how flex the modules get. So of course, in this example here, if I wanted to then give a role that permission, I'm going to click the little check boxes. So I'm, in this case, giving the access to that content overview page to both my contributors and my publisher. Pretty straightforward. Um, incidentally, I don't know how many of you have upgraded to 10.3, but this feature right here is a lifesaver. There's an autocomplete form at the top of permissions now. So if you're still not on 10.3, that could be a re or 10.2. Um, if you're not on 10.2 yet, that is a reason to upgrade by itself. It is so much easier to find a permission, at least if you know the general name of what the permission is going to be and can get close. Um, so we've got those basic roles and permissions. That is the most simple part of roles and permissions in core, right? Um, and then we have the ability to turn on some more core modules to expand from there. So we, we can do things with status and with workflow. And whenever I'm thinking about status, that's the simplest thing we have. It's just published or it's not published. And we have a permission to view published content or view unpublished content. You can apply those to things, and then we have access control put in place. Simplest way you can do it. We want to expand that, though, with the concept of workflow states. And in Drupal, I, I, you know, this is one of those things, if you've been using Drupal for a while, you kind of understand what this form means. But it literally, you could have 20 different states that only use those three fields to define what that state does, right? You've got the name, the label, that, that's going to help people understand how to use the state. Mark for review. That could be a state, right? This is in review, basically. Um, you have whether or not it's published, so that's triggering whether that status field is triggered to be true, published, or false, not published. And then you have default revision. If a state is published and a default revision, it is published. If a state is unpublished and a default revision, it is unpublished. If it is not a default revision, and it is not published, it's just some draft state. So you can have as many different draft states as you want. And I kind of show an example of that. Whenever I'm thinking of the draft state that I like to use, one of them is this, this idea of I want to put it in review. I want a contributor to be able to say that a publisher needs to make that thing go public. So in my transitions, I can actually define, OK, I want my editors to be required to go to a review state before it can go to a published state as an example, right? And the role or the, uh, the from and to here actually kind of defines what that transition is going to allow. Now the awesome thing is every single transition you create gets a set of checkboxes on the permission page, right? So what you've, what you've got there is the ability to say, not this state is permissioned, but the transitioning from one state to another is what's uh, um, actually permissioned in the system. Is that kind of making sense for everybody? So this allows us to kind of take a simple approach to many, many websites in terms of how we do access control, even some fairly large ones. Um, another pause here, this is Multnomah Falls. It's not in Portland proper. It's a little bit further down the gorge. This particular photo was taken in February when the walls were freezing around the waterfalls. Wonderful hike, so much fun. Frozen bridges are, yeah, just going to say scary. Um, but so much fun. So uh, I like to say that editors are going to edit, right? You know, they're, they're going to do whatever you give them permission to do. Whether or not you want them to do that, they are going to do it at some time, sometimes on accident, because they just don't understand the system. So you have to take all that into account whenever you're creating this access control, right? You want to say, oh, I don't want people to be able to delete someone else's content that they work so hard on because I may not be able to recover that. Or I might have to go to a backup in order to recover it, and none of us want to have to go pull a backup from the previous day. Or if it was made in such a short window that it's not in a backup every, anywhere, we wanna, don't want to deal with that. So we have to take that into account. We also have to think about, well, are they going to edit somebody else's stuff and, and kind of disrupt the work that they did? So we have to take that into account in terms of how we are putting our access controls in place. So let's give them some same defaults, right? So we might, um, we might say, instead of telling them to delete content or permissioning them to delete content, we give them a mark for deletion state. 
That tells the intent that the content should be deleted, but then we can set up a workflow that basically says, maybe 30 days from now, we'll delete that thing. The mark for deletion state is an unpublished default state, the same as unpublished. But it gives us this ability to put the intent in the system that, that we can then follow up on. Um, another thing that we can do to make sure that people don't disrupt things is track every revision. There is a permission related to the idea of deleting a revision from the system. I almost never give that to my general editors. Instead, I want them to have to track everything. And that way, we can give them a whole lot of permission because we're tracking everything, and if we have bad actors, we can actually follow up with them with some additional training. So it kind of keeps it straightforward. Um, I'm also, you know, you're, when you're dividing up content into lots and lots of different groups uh, within your site, and I'm using groups in this sense with a small g, um, it makes sense to give them this, this entity reference that says this belongs to this section of the site. It doesn't have to enforce permissions. If you've got a, editors that you trust, that you're tracking all their revisions, and you don't let them delete things. And so you, you can literally just use core, and I've done this recently with uh, Washington County, for those of you that are in the uh, Portland area, you're familiar with Washington County. We did their entire permission structure with well over 150 editors. We were like, you know what, we trust you. Just don't mess with somebody else's content. You can't delete it. We'll mark it for, for deletion and we'll come back and we'll clean it up later. And it's working really well. Like, you didn't have to put all those things in place to prevent people from doing that. Now, I did hear from somebody who works with a university uh, client. They said, well, you just don't know university professors. <laughs> they have vendettas. And so maybe you need to do something more complex and that can happen. So uh, we talked about roles earlier. I mentioned contributor, I mentioned publisher, uh, that, that default role with administrator. And those were the states that I kind of listed out. We've got the draft. We got in review, which has the intent that we expect something to happen with that review, published, unpublished, and then marked for deletion. So one of the things I like to do with that in review is put the revision log message as close to the status change as possible. Uh, most of you know that the revision log message by default, whenever you turn on content moderation and everything else, it's in the administrative kind of sidebar of the page over to the side. Isn't that a, kind of annoying? I, I will say in the Starshot demo today, they were using the gen admin thing. I like what the gen admin theme does. It puts that publication state and moderation state, it puts it up at the top of the form. That way it's right next to the revision log when you're, at least when you're in a desktop context. context. Um, the other way to do it would be this, and I've done this with the Claro theme quite a few times where we, we basically just kind of move that idea of in review, so I'm changing my, uh, my, ch my ch able to change my status. Um, I've got my notify reviewers, that's just an entity reference field of the users of whatever type I need to notify. Yeah, that could be all my publishers, so that they can put those in. It could be all my users, because maybe I, I want them to give access to everybody to do it. And then I do a little bit of uh, form hook uh, manipulation there to put the revision log message underneath it, so that it's right there, all nice and, nice and compact. Uh, and the code for this, by the way, uh, you can totally steal it from the slides, and I will be putting these slides up on Session Eyes, and uh, I'll put them on my blog as well, and I mentioned that at the end of the um, presentation. But um, that's all it takes to basically just move that revision log message down into the footer next to the save form. So really, really, really slick. And uh, by also putting the field reviewer in there, it all goes under a little uh, horizontal rule, or it's actually a border in the Claro theme. So it, it kind of like logically separates it there at the bottom of the footer, which is kind of cool. It's not really access control, but it's something to just make it easier for people to understand what it is that you're trying to do. So in action, to kind of look at what a workflow would look like for a typical editor, um, Eddie decides to contribute something to the site. They, saves a they save a draft. Maybe they save another draft. Uh, because boy, editors love to create drafts. Um, then, then when they're happy with their work, they say, okay, I'm gonna mark it as in review. And at this point, Polly Publisher jumps in and says, hey, I'm gonna publish that. Eddie says, oh no, Polly missed that I had a typo. I'm gonna make another revision, sign it to in review again. Goes to Polly and Polly marks it as published again. So it's kind of a nice little workflow that you take it through. Now, if we were talking about that marking content for deletion, we start with something that's in the published state. It no longer needs to be out there. It's, it's time for it to go. 
Polly comes in, moves it to mark to, for deletion, and then forgets about it. And then on the back end, you can create a view for your site administrators to go in and do a bulk operation once a month. You can automate the process and say, I'm gonna have a cron job that actually kicks off maybe something with uh, um, e the ECA module, you know, the event controller action sort of approach. You could have something like that set up and it's just automatically gonna take care of that trash can, if you will, over time. Um, I always like to show this, this kind of revision step-by-step -step to new editors to kind of get them to understand reverting a revision and when you might do that. Because keep in mind, we're keeping all the revisions and there's a lot of power in that, but with that power comes some complexity that I, I find editors often get confused on. Um, so they publish a draft, they pub have published content, they create a draft, they create another draft, and they're like, oh no, there's something wrong in that published content, but now I've also been working on this thing that I'm gonna release next week that's not ready to go yet. What do I do? That's when we go in and we show them how to use that revert button on the revisions tab. They revert their published revision, which will take and create a new revision that is exactly the same as the previous revision. You're gonna have identical revisions except for the timestamp and the revision log message. And it pulls it in front of those drafts so that they can make the edit and publish it again. And then right after they do that, and this is an important part of the training, um, you then give them the ability to take that last draft and revert it. And because it's an unpublished, not default revision, reverting that then brings it to the front of the, uh, uh, front of the stack again, if you wanna think of it. So I always like to show that to editors because I think it helps them kind of get through the idea of, oh no, what do I do when I need to do this? I need to fix something on published content, but I've got revisions in front of me. All right, so I talked about grouping things and putting them into kind of, I, I often think of as a subsite. you know, it, depending on your organization, um, it could be a bureau as with the city of Portland, Washington County had departments, you could have divisions, sections, whatever they call, there's some sort of um, identification that allows for that structure, right? Um, I often put those groups into a simple content type called group. Um, I often present the field as something like displayed in or belongs to, um, and it just shows up on the node form for the editor to be able to add that. It's usually required, because I don't want content to just exist that doesn't belong to something. I wanna give it that structure. And then, we, on the user, we, we go ahead and we say, all right, I'm now gonna add a groups field on the user, and I'm gonna say this is all the groups that this user belongs to. This is all still just using core, right? I've not added anything to it, um, just an entity reference field. In this case, I made it unlimited. If you wanted your person to only belong to a single group, you could make it um, a singular one if you wanted to. And that lets me create views that are kind of like, I'm gonna talk about wor Workbench a little bit later, even though we're not going over the Workbench module. Uh, Workbench does something like this, right? It gives you access to your content, and it, it kind of relies on the idea of did you create it? With this My Groups, it says, well, are you in the same group as this content? And this view just represents a standard view uh, with a relation that points to the, the user's groups, and it, it then aggregates all the things that they have access to edit. And it's surprising, but even though, you know, they could look at all content or all media and they could edit somebody else's stuff, they don't because they've got these nice little views where they say, oh, this is the stuff I'm responsible for. This is my content. This is my media. And they're able to work from that. So that's the simple way to do things. Uh, let's talk about some more complex ways to do things. Uh, by the way, this is a shot uh, on, uh, let's see, I'm on the lower McClay Trail and I'm running my way, actually I think it was hiking this day, but I'm making my way up to Piddock Mansion, uh, which is also a beautiful view of the city, but it's coming from up in the West Hills. Um, incidentally, Forest Park is one of the largest urban forests uh, in the United States. If you get a chance to get up there, it's like eight miles long park in the middle of the city. As you're walking into these forests, literally, sound from the city just dies away and it becomes more and more forest. It's, it's kind of magical, uh, especially if you hit there on a foggy day, which uh, well, who knows, with these temperature changes, you might get to see something like that. And I, by the way, I, as I shift back into talking about the group module here, this is not my module, uh, Christian, uh, and I'm gonna, I hope I don't butcher his name, but Van de Und. Um, Christian is amazing. Um, he maintains the heck out of the group module and the subgroup module on that ecosystem. And, and 
these are the, pe the people who give him bug reports are doing some of the hardest things with Drupal sites because they have all this complicated access control. So if you ever put a bug report into these, these issue queues, just be patient, right? You know, because th what they're doing is the hard stuff. You know, we're, we're getting to do the easy part by building sites with this. They're doing the hard stuff of making all that access control work and making these rules and permissions work the way that they need to. So let's talk about group relationships. Um, if you're familiar with the groups module version one, or I'm sorry, the group module, I, I'm gonna say the word group so many times today and, and there's the group module versus creating groups. Totally different, right? But the group module is what we're talking about here. Um, it used to be called group content, the relationship that held these things together, uh, but it was changed in both version two and version three, version two of the module is an upgrade path for groups version one. If you're doing a brand new site and you've not used the group module before, go ahead and install group three. That is the future of group, if you will. So if you need to migrate from one to two, that's, that's the path there. But if you're starting from scratch right now, go ahead and start with three. Um, so it starts with, out of the box, the ability for you to create relationships between a group entity type and content entity types, and a group entity type, and your user entity type. And the group relationship itself is an entity type. So you're basically taking three things and creating a relationship between them. And that, that's kind of cool because it means that you can actually query either direction. Unlike an entity reference where it's kind of like a one way and you really have to think about wh which direction you're coming on that entity reference, uh, with the group relationship, it actually makes it really powerful for creating views um, that kind of pull from the user side or pu pull from the content side, kind of make it work either way. And um, there is a group media module out there and it allows you to do the same thing with media. So if you want your media to have that same sort of access control as your content, um, that can also be applied with the group media module. So if we're thinking about group relationships, um, one of the cool things is it's kind of the ability to do one to many, right? You know, your entity reference, you're able to do that one to many. You can do the same thing here. And for each of those groups, and the example I would give here is if you have a user that has a group relationship of a membership to multiple groups, right? So there's one user and they've got two, three, 100 groups that they belong to. Or it could be the same thing with like say news and events. If you have news and events where the relationship, the group is kind of a, um, something where you might want that news to appear not only on uh, the Department of Aging and Dis Dis yeah. the Department of Aging and Disabilities. I chose the wrong department name there. I don't know if y'all noticed that. But if I wanted that content that they were publishing to also appear on the health department page because that was the parent organization, then I could use that multi-group relationship on news and have it appear in both very easily for the editors, that sort of thing. So let's go, go ahead and build this. I didn't, uh, I was gonna do this as a live demo and I, I still have to shout out uh, Wim Lears for doing the live coding the other day. That I, impresses the heck out of me. I just wasn't willing to do it for these because I have so many uh, local environments running uh, that I just knew it would crash if I tried to do it live. So I'm gonna detailed screenshots here to get us through things. You've installed group. You get the uh, groups tab up here at the top. Um, and now the very first thing I want to do is add a group type. So I've I've gone ahead here and set up two group types. Um, these are the two group types that I typically would recommend for most sites. Um, open, which means that people can see it, anybody can see it, and restricted, which means that only people who belong to the group can see it. And the way to think about this is an open group might be set up so that if it's a public site, it's set up so that anonymous users can see all the content in the open group. Authenticated users can see all the content in the open group, but the only people who can see the unpublished content and do the edits and revisions and things like that on it are members of that group, members with some sort of role related to what they're supposed to do in the group. And then the private or kind of restricted group, uh, the idea behind that is that it's, it's probably more for an intranet. And, and in an intranet, you, know, you might have some open groups where you have all your employees seeing it, 
but you might have some restricted groups, which we used to great effect with a, a city of Portland as an example. We had like our tech team wig, uh, wikis were kind of, or documentation, were all contained in restricted groups. It wasn't something that needed to show up in anybody else's search results except ours. Um, and so we could put in some content in there that, that worked really well to kind of restrict access to it. So if you're doing kind of the intranet, extranet thing, uh, thinking about private groups is a kind of a good way to do it. So when you add a group type, this is kind of what the form looks like. Here I am adding my open. Uh, whenever I get down to the creator settings, what that's saying is whoever creates the group, what kind of uh, roles do we want to assign them, you know? Because if you create a group and you don't have roles assigned to you, you and I've done this before when doing the configuration, you, you, you can't edit it. And actually, in the latest version of groups, you can't even edit it with super user. Like, I, you have to go in the database to fix the thing. So it's, it's kind of one of those things where you want to give some sort of permissions from the very start. Um, and then there's these other access settings where you have this opportunity to kind of automatically create a few different roles. Um, I actually recommend going ahead, um, click all of those, especially if it's your first time using the group module. They're a good sane set of defaults and it's gonna create you some roles that you can kind of work from. So once I've done that and I hit save, uh, here's my big warning, right? I, I've hit save and I didn't check those boxes and then I go and I create my first group. Well, if you didn't create your group roles and permissions first, you've just lost that content into your database in this weird way where you're gonna have to you know, kind of struggle to recover it through the database. So always create all those roles and permissions and everything else before creating that first group in your site. You wanna make sure the permissions are really locked down. So, but when you do click that button, it's basically gonna give you this view right here. And you can see it gave me an anonymous, an outsider, a member, an admin, and an administrator role. Um, I usually go ahead and add in uh, a couple more, and I add in, oh, I'm sorry, I just moved it up so you could see the second administrator role. I was wondering what I did there. Um, so you can see there's actually two administrator roles, and the reason why it does this is because it treats outsider and member permissions a little bit different. So an outsider is someone who doesn't have one of those group to user relationships, right? It's, it's somebody who's basically unknown to the group. You don't show up in the members table. Um, if you want people to be able to see that, you actually have to create these outsider roles. And in the case of the double administrator role here, that's actually synchronizing to our site-wide administrator role. And by having that kind of auto-created super administrator, it makes it so those administrators can actually get into every group that's created no matter what. So I, I highly recommend clicking those boxes because it gives your site administrators kind of access to manage every group. There, I guess there could be a situation where you've got an organization where you need to like hide things even from the technical people who support it. And technically you could do that with this. I mean like if your super user can't get into it, um, that's, that's, that's pretty locked down. And it is possible to do with this. So I usually go ahead and add a contributor and publisher role here as well. And you'll notice when I'm adding these roles, I'm actually synchronizing them with my site-wide roles. So that means that all the kind of things that I'm saying those site-wide roles are capable of, I'm putting them into this place, okay? So it's, it's just kind of automatically creating all that for me. Contributor, publisher, um, it's same kind of basic ideas as the lower group, the lowercase groups, right? We're, we're giving access to, to create versus the access to publish. And you know what that gives us? <laughs> Even more checkboxes. Yeah, because we love checkboxes in the Drupal world. By the way, I, I have to call out something. Um, there is a module out there that is called, oh God, it is, I thought it was on this slide. Ah, I must have been on my earlier checkboxes slide. Uh, but it's called permissions drag click. And it literally adds a little JavaScript library into your admin pages so that you can click a checkbox and drag it and it will check all the boxes as you're moving down the page. Um, I, I haven't used it a ton, uh, but it, it came up whenever I was searching because uh, actually I think it was Richard, you one time had a browser extension. And it, it, Richard was going to town, clicking all these boxes, and I'm like, dude, I want that. Uh, but I don't really want it with a browser extension because I don't, I don't trust browser extension makers. I don't know about y'all. 
But uh, it, the idea that you could have like this really simple JavaScript library that you can review and it's open source and all that kind of fun stuff and it gets applied to just Claro. Actually, it gets applied just to the permissions page in that module, which is kind of fun. Uh, but it's a cool way to do it. Um, so now that I've, you know, I, before I click any of those, those checkboxes, I definitely want to go in here and configure some content to be available to my groups. Now, I'm not actually a huge fan of um, what they've called it, but th they call it a, uh, a content plugin, um, even though users are one of the things that you can apply to it. It's, it's kind of an entity plugin is basically what you're creating. And so what I would do is I would see a con set of content types, and here is a set of content types I, I frequently use. You know, we all basically have a, a page and a post, an event, maybe an alert that's a banner across the pages, maybe notifications if we want banners that only appear on groups, because you can kind of do both. Um, so, and then I have some media types here. So for each of these, I would want to install that plugin. And what that's gonna show me is this, this configuration for that plugin installation. It's saying, what does my group relationship look like? Um, almost all the time, you can just leave this as is and do a cardinality of one. Um, you know, the entity cardinality is always one. You'll notice it's disabled because you, you really don't want to do a one to many in this place, but how many groups can this entity belong to? That's, that's what that is asking. So if I'm doing the user one, I probably want it to be unlimited so they can belong to lots of groups. If I'm doing content, I might restrict it so that they can only belong to one. Um, and then the last bit there is kind of an interesting one. It says two-step wizard. And you're like, why would I need a two-step wizard to create a relationship to a group? Well, I've never used it, but these group relationships are fieldable. So you can actually put fields on the relationship that are different than what would be on the content um, or the user, as an example. Um, so really, really powerful in terms of what that looks like. But this, this basic recipe of how many groups do you want it to belong to, um, and then just go ahead and click save with the two-step wizard turned off is usually gonna be what you wanna go for. So now that I've done that, um, I can look at my checkboxes again and start thinking about what I want stuff to, to look like. Uh, so for what editing within the group, I can let my contributors and publishers see everything. They've got their content workflow. Which, by the way, one of the reasons why we synchronize those group membership roles, or, you know, so I've got, you know, contributor publisher synchronizing to my site-wide contributor publisher is because that transition that we were talking about earlier in workflow, that's only site-wide. Group is not aware of transition permissions. Group is only aware of can edit, can view, can view revisions. Those are the only three permissions that it kind of alters. So you still need those site-wide roles to somehow be tied to what they're doing in the group in order to keep everything kind of nice and neat. Kind of making sense, okay? Um, if I were configuring the open group type, you know, I might uh, make it so that everybody can see the view published group right here. Um, if, if I'm doing the private group type, I'm probably not giving anything to outsiders in that same area. So trying to figure out what your, your actual needs are for your product and then you get it set up there. So let's dive into an example. Um, these are some screenshots that I mocked up from a really old version of the, the Portland uh, project that I was working on. So here we have Portland employees. Um, and I'm, I'm sitting at my homepage right here, right? And as a user, what I've created now is this ability for the user to get something customized. So this is definitely the intranet example of things. Um, you can see on the left-hand side here, I've got some maybe citywide groups that everybody automatically gets added to. And you could do that with, again, you could do it with something like ECA. We had some custom scripts that we did as a part of uh, synchronizing users into the directory on the site because we had a user directory where things could be searched. And so we knew there were active directory groups that they belonged to and we would automatically synchronize them to groups accordingly. Um, so that kind of creates those citywide groups that they belong to and also potentially groups that they follow. Now, the cool thing about groups, uh, er, the group module, is it does have this concept of a permission to allow people to join a group. Uh, for any of you who have used groups.drupal.org, that's an example of that. You know, you can join the group and choose to be a part of it, and it actually transforms your homepage content accordingly. Um, that can look like a lot of different things. We actually wrote a little custom code to, uh, to expose the leave follow or the 
follow leave, depending on, I guess you'd have to follow first before you could leave. The follow leave uh, button, we exposed that to views through a little bit of custom code and made it uh, so that it would actually show people, hey, this is, these are the groups that you belong to on this giant group page. And this was really cool because it allowed people like say, our editors who we don't know anything about them in Active Directory that says that they are a editor of a particular group. Um, but they can choose to join our training content. So all of those city web editors belong to that group um, by following it on this group's page. So really powerful kind of way to get people involved. Um, you can also, of course, leave that group. And because we wanted everything to belong uh, in kind of a group structure, I, I do wanna talk a little bit about this, this concept of a menu. Uh, for any of you who have worked on a really big Drupal site, uh, menuing kind of falls apart, right? Um, that, that menu UI only grows so large. There are modules out there, uh, if you haven't seen Big Menu, it's kind of cool, it turns the menu UI into this kind of like drill down experience so you can dig deeper and deeper. Um, I found that whenever I'm presenting the menu UI to my editors and I'm on the edit form, I almost always use client-side hierarchical select uh, so that I, I let them drill down the menu tree instead of one line select list. You know, th so th there's some things you can do there. Throw that all out the window for group because uh, like the example with the city of Portland, their public site, 750 groups so everything from an advisory group to a bureau to a program, like all these different things that they need to segment the content in some way and segment who can order it. Oh, and 2,000 editors? Yeah, actually I think it may be higher by now because that was, that was a year ago the last time I did the, uh, the, the audit of, of editor usage. So you've got all these, and by the way, almost all of those editors did not get their permission from the core team they got their permissions from the group admin who was able to then give them permissions to the group and it automatically synchronizes to their role. So it really expands the way that you can distribute and kind of like make uh, access control something that you spread out across a really large organization. Uh, great alternative uh, for those of you who, who have done like massive multi-site implementations where you end up with a separate database for each and every one of them. And this, they've got one site to log into and instead of having multiple sites that are essentially the same, you have one monolithic site uh, with really uh, fancy access control and permissions. But that menu right there is actually kind of interesting. It's made up of a few fields on the page content type. So there's a show and menu, which is not that different from the core you know, show and menu. Uh, there's the menu text, what do you want it to appear as in the, uh, in the menu? And then there's the menu parent. All of that looks very similar to what you would see uh, whenever you're, you're, you're constructing a menu using the core menu system, but it's just fields. And then this view uses that group relationship to say, okay, what are my pages without a parent that are said to show in a menu? Show those to me. Do any of those pages have children? I can indicate that with the little uh, uh, chevron to, to drill down from there. And then if I were to click on any of those with a chevron, there's actually a display mode that we used that used an entity views attach to show the children for the page that you're on um, attached to the view mode being pulled in. It sounds really complex, but it's super cool and it all caches because it's views. Um, and so you can build these massive uh, structures that within a group, the menuing system can actually go all the way down to the level of, of grandchildren with really solid breadcrumbing all the way through. So it's a kind of a powerful way to get around the idea that how big can this site get before menus fall apart? Well, you don't have to use the menu system if you have these relationships and you can build it out into a simple block view that then appears within the, the group's page layout. So, and we're using Layout Builder in this case, but yeah, you could be doing that with, with any layout technique that's appropriate. Just like the page that we had the, the My Groups before where we had the uh, My Content versus All Content, we still have that ability to kind of restrict things down to what groups does that person belong to. And now I can show that into those custom views. So it's very similar to the, the simple approach that's just using an entity reference. This one just has the extra power of also having all the access control applied to it. So nobody can actually even see the, the content that's, that's not theirs. So we're now we're gonna talk about some alternatives, which seemed really appropriate to have a concert venue for alternatives. Uh, 
Though ironically, that is the Yandermatten string band, which is folk and uh, bluegrass. But all that to say, uh, great concert venue here in Portland. If you haven't been to Revolution Hall, it's a, uh, a former high school that got uh, transformed into a venue. And so you, you literally watch the concerts in a high school auditorium. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. The seats aren't super comfortable if you're up in the balcony, but it does have a balcony, which is kind of cool. Uh, the floor is just yeah, kind of wide open, mosh pit style. But fun venue, uh, fun bands. I just saw Bombay Bicycle Club there and the most rocking concert, so much fun. Um, so if I'm thinking about different things that are out there for access control, uh, one longtime standard for the Drupal community is Workbench, uh, specifically Workbench access. So um, Workbench used to provide the functionality that core content moderation and workflows provided. Um, but whenever that came into core, Workbench kind of stripped all that out. And it, it's basically, if you turn it on, it's a set of views to try to improve your editor experience. Workbench Access does not need Workbench, even though they're in the same suite of modules. You can turn on Workbench Access without Workbench, no problem. What Workbench Access gives us is this ability to set content access schemes um, that typically have hierarchy. The two that come out of the box are taxonomy and menu, which um, if you're familiar with Drupal, both taxonomy and menu have this concept of what is the parent of this menu item or what is the parent of this term. So if I'm looking at the different ways I could do that, I could set up a menu access here. I set it to the site map as the menu that I want it to track to. And then I tell it what content types should, should belong to that menu schema or access scheme. Um, and then uh, what's gonna end up happening then is on any piece of, uh, or on any user, I get a new tab called Workbench Access. And because I've added uh, a menu scheme, I can now select where in that menu Poly Publisher should be able to edit. And this is kind of cool, it inherits. So it goes all the way down the tree. So if I assign them to Health and Human Services, they will get assigned to everything under Health and Human Services to be able to edit. So that's super powerful if you have that, that menu structure, if your site's big enough, but not too big, because that, that menu, I mean, you can see that list of checkboxes there. Imagine that on that portland.gov site I was talking about, that it's 750 groups, not even counting all the content. I, I think the content counts were getting close to 100,000 uh, last year. So um, yeah, you wouldn't want to do that with a menu structure that had thousands, you know? Um, incidentally, if you need that same inheritance structure, uh, Christian also uh, maintains the subgroup module. It's not like group subgroup, it's, it's just subgroup. Um, and subgroup gives you the ability to say, I want my group inheritance structure to work up or down the chain, right? So if I assign somebody to the deepest level, it goes up, or I assign somebody to the highest level and it goes down. You can kind of do other with that, either with the subgroup module, pretty powerful. So the other uh, scheme of access scheme that you have within Workbench is this ability to do things based on taxonomy. So maybe I have a secondary taxonomy that I want to use, because not everything fits into a menu structure, like if I've got news and events, I'm probably not putting news and events into a menu. That would be weird. But I might tag them with a taxonomy. And so you can do that same sort of thing where on your, your editor's page, you actually have this ability to assign them to taxonomy terms within the structure. And then that gives them the access to things. The only drawback to this, and it's, it's kind of one of the things that I'm not a huge fan of, um, if I've got that whole menu structure and all of my groups are represented both in the menu structure and in the taxonomy scheme, that's a lot of duplication. And it feels kind of inefficient, but it, it does at least give you that ability to give very fine grain uh, access controls to folks. Another uh, option that's out there is uh, taxonomy access control light. Uh, I won't go as deep into this one. Um, it also involves schemes. There's a lot of scheming in the access control world. <laughs> um, <laughs> So this idea is, you know, you, you set what is the vocabulary this in, in this example, I'm doing access by taxonomy. Um, I, what vocabulary am I gonna use? How many schemes does it have? And each scheme is built off of the idea of uh, basically view, edit, delete. Those are your, your three options that you work with. And your scheme is saying, okay, how do I want my permissions to be there? So one of the cool things about taxonomy access control light is it does use uh, the node access table. It doesn't add any additional tables. It just adds this idea that you can rebuild your access based on whatever scheme you've put in. Um, so here is an example with the view. 
Um, you know, I'm able to put that in there whenever I'm all done. I got my second scheme. So that first one would be like, this is the scheme for people who can view published content. This is the scheme for people who edit the content. Kind of pretty straightforward there. Um, and then um, on my individual users, I get this page that says access by taxonomy. Now, the cool thing is you can actually do the scheme. You can apply it to roles uh, or you can apply it to individual users. And then of course they get into here. Similar to workbench access, if you've got a really large tree, this is horrible to look at because your tree is just gonna be gigantic in terms of uh, what you're seeing on the, this particular grant page where you're granting that access to someone. Uh, one that I learned about yesterday, thank you, Keegan, appreciate it, um, was access policy. Now, th this module is still on alpha. Um, it's probably why I didn't know about it, honestly, but it's kind of cool. I was, I was playing with it last night, trying to get it to the point that I was going to include it in the presentation. Um, this idea of uh, being able to kind of define all these different access control policies and then apply those in the system is really cool. And it would extend beyond just being able to create that kind of group relationship. It, sh it should be able to do that, it totally should. I, I'm missing something in the configuration or I would demo it. Um, the example they give uh, in their documentation is one for doing it with a taxonomy. I was doing it with a node content type. I'm sure that's why it wasn't working. But all that to say, like you, you configure that and it also is using those site-wide rules combined with these access policy uh, schemes to, to be able to determine what can someone edit. But beyond that, you can actually apply access policy schemes to other things like making them date time based. You could actually say editing is restricted to within these hours. And I was like, huh, that's kind of cool because like I could totally see having an access control scheme that said I don't want my editors to be able to edit anything an hour before my deployment window and then through an hour after my deployment window. That it really cuts down on the uh, likelihood that you're gonna you know, lock somebody out in the middle of an edit. I thought that was kind of cool. So I, I am excited to explore that one a bit more and kind of dive into it and dig into it. Um, it's, it's really promising in terms of what it offers. So what about organic groups? My, uh, my slide didn't animate the right way, so this joke may fall flat, but organic groups was the real OG. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, for those of you who've been using Drupal for a while, uh, if you've gone to groups.drupal.org, um, that is using organic groups. Uh, beautiful project, used for so many cool things. Uh, anybody here familiar with Acquia Commons? Surprisingly few. That was a great like starting point. I know Bob's familiar with it because yeah, we, that's what we launched at Multnomah County back in the day. Um, so uh, Acquia Commons was basically an intranet in a box. Uh, and it had, a, a, as a distribution, it had a whole bunch of things behind it. Um, sadly, Acquia completely abandoned it at <laughs> the Drupal 8. They, they never took it into Drupal 8 space. Um, so it was kind of one of those things where it's like, okay, what do I do now? I have organic groups and I have this old common site. What do I do? Or uh, anybody familiar with Open Atrium? We got like two or three hands there. Okay, Open Atrium, also extranet, intranet in a box. Phase two did a lot of great work on that. Just like uh, Commons, it got kind of abandoned at Drupal 7. You know, it, it never made it past that leap into Drupal 8. Um, and, and, and really, I mean, it's, it's a shame. It's a simpler model. Um, it basically had this idea that it was your group relationship was a node reference. And then they just added some extra access controls on top of it. Um, it there is an alpha version of the Drupal 8 version out there. Um, it's, it's still pretty rough though. It doesn't have much of a UI. So if you were going to go down that path, as much as I, I like the model, you'd be doing a lot of code, your, your own code, or a lot of contribution back to organic groups to try to get it to catch up. So for those of you familiar with it, fond memories, um, not necessarily something that you're gonna apply to a, a current modern site going forward. So what should I use for my Drupal site? Well, we'll end on this. Um, if your site is small, say like a blog, a marketing site, something like that, um, you, you, don't, you don't have a lot of different editors and users, you're probably going with something simple. You're going with core, right? You're saying, hey, what can I do with the publish unpublished state? Or what can I do with content moderation with some basic workflows? If you have a lot of editors and high trust, like I was, the example I was giving with Washington County, um, I highly recommend sticking with core still. You know, you, you do that high trust model, mark for deletion, track all your revisions, you know, 
that, that works really well even with a pretty significant number of editors. Now, if you have dozens of editors and lower trust and you really like that hierarchical structure that was being provided, Workbench Access or Tax Enemy Access Control Lite, both are, are valid. I, I really like Workbench Access. They've been maintaining that really well for a very long time. Uh, it does cool things. So I can actually see Workbench Access in combination with a multi-site implementation, like say if you were a university where you had a uh, big multi-site implementation, everybody's sharing the same code base, but they then they get to customize it based on content and configuration and then throw a workbench access in there so that within each site, they've got a nice handy like menu system based access control. That could be a really cool way to do it. And if you've got that big monstrosity, the thing that has all of the editors and all the groups, the group module is a really slick way to do it. Um, there's some, some cool additional code that we did for the Portland project to, to synchronize an entity reference field to group assignments for content that you know, like made it so much easier for editors to kind of like change their mind about what group something belonged in. Um, there's some cool things they could do around that, um, but it, it definitely scales really big to lots of groups, lots of editors, uh, with the caveat that you're gonna have to think about how you're gonna handle menuing, or if your site doesn't need menuing, if you're able to do things with just relationship, it, it can work really well there as well. I covered a lot of modules, so my, uh, my slides will actually include links to everything uh, because that, that's a lot in there to, to go through. Oh, sorry, so people taking pictures. I'll, I'll let you take the picture. Okay, that's one. Okay, and here's the second one. There we go. So all the modules we covered today, and I, I may have mentioned a couple more that I need to add to there because I think I mentioned uh, two that, that were not included. One last photo for you all. We're uh, in beautiful Portland. If you haven't seen the skylight at night, it is beautiful. If you uh, have a strong constitution and don't get scared easily and you're in a group, I highly recommend <laughs> going down to the East Vegas Esplanade uh, and uh, looking back across the river at the city at night. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and thank you. Uh, if you need to find me, I'm Joshua Wami on Drupal.org, also in Drupal Slack. <laughs> And I took us all the way to time, so there's no time for questions, but uh, I, I will stick around for a couple minutes if y'all want.